Come on in, sit down. I think we're about ready to get going. You ready? Yep. Hi, I'm Randy Bias. Um, probably many of you know me. Um, for those of you who don't, I might have been involved with this OpenStack thing for a little while, since about summer of 2010. And during that time, I've spent a lot of time talking to customers and people who are deploying clouds. And there's one thing I tell them very consistently over and over and over again. I say they're sort of the old way of doing things, call it legacy, call it enterprise computing, call it second platform, whatever you want. And then there's the new way, the cloud native way, third platform. And when I tell them this, I do this because I want them to understand that you can't really cross the streams. Like if you take second platform or, or non-cloud native applications and you try to stick them on Amazon, just lift and shift, right? They have a problem. They can't manage their own availability, right? I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried to put Chef or Puppet around Oracle. I have, and it's not pleasant, right? Um, so the whole thing is, is it's very difficult to apply DevOps and those kinds of things to a Platform 2 app and stick it on Platform 3 infrastructure, right? A cloud native infrastructure. And it's also difficult to go back the other way, but for different reasons. And the reason is, is that when you take a, a, a cloud native application and you stick it on something like VMware or vBlock, it's very expensive to run. A lot of what we're trying to do is reduce costs so you don't get the value out of it. So true story, there was an analytics company, a risk analytics company in New Jersey that was telling me very proudly about their Hadoop deployment. And they had put Hadoop on top of their Cisco UCS B-series blades attached to a fiber channel SAN, right? And so they didn't get the value of Hadoop because they were running you know, a modern cloud native application on a gold-plated infrastructure. But if we stop and we think about it, at some point in the future, kind of cloud native systems, Amazon Web Services, Google, OpenStack, all those things become good enough to run at least some of the third platform, or excuse me, some of the legacy workloads. And so I did a blog post on Friday to kind of tee up this session, and I talked about this thing called the rancher's dilemma, which is that you might be thinking pets, you might be thinking cattle, but if you're a rancher, you kind of got to deal with both, whether you like it or not, right? And that's where most enterprises are today. So what I thought would be really cool is if we could show you some technology that EMC has, namely Scale.io, think of it as a competitor to Ceph, that does some of these things, that allows us to have certain capabilities that you, wouldn't, that you couldn't have uh, in, uh, in sort of more modern cloud systems so that, you can afford to, so that you can run legacy applications. So a good example of that is Oracle Rack. Oracle Rack is a distributed version of an Oracle database, and it requires writing to a multi-master disk, which means every database instance has to write to the same disk, right? And so Scalo can actually uh, uh, allow for that particular use case. And that's very difficult, actually, when you're running a Scalo model. So today, what we're going to show you is we're going to show you um, running a very high-performance workload of Oracle and then live migrating that, and it's completely enabled by Scale.io. Thank you, Randy. Can you hear me? Cool. So um, just as far as the flow goes, I'm going to talk a little bit about Scale.io for those that aren't familiar, how we've integrated it into OpenStack, talk a little bit about what, we're, what the demo is built on, and then I'm going to do the demo. And so there'll be periods where you can ask questions while we're waiting for things in the demo to fail over. Um, and then at the end, we'll have uh, a lottery to give away a free Amazon Echo. That's what you all came for, right? <laughs> Uh, so a little bit about myself, I'm a Scale.io product manager, and my goal is to make sure that Scale.io is integrated as best as it can into OpenStack through our vendors or directly with OpenStack as well. And so please do reach out to me if you see any gaps in anything we've implemented in, in, our, in our fuel, our Mirantis uh, fuel plugins, and our um, canonical charms that we're developing right now. Um, I want to hear it, and I want to make it as good as it can be, because I think that Scale.io is an absolutely natural fit for OpenStack as you play with it and download it. It's free to download and play with, with no limits, no time limits, just non-production. Uh, let us know what you think. Uh, we want that feedback. We want to improve the product to make it what it needs to be to be the best scale-out block storage for OpenStack. So what is Scale.io? So Scale.io is a scale-out block storage solution that uses Ethernet or fiber channel, or sorry, yeah, bad word. Um, Ethernet or InfiniBand, it just needs an, a TCP IP connection between the nodes and takes that local disk and shares it out. And it does it with an extremely small amount of overhead. Um, we're talking 
5 to 15 percent of the CPU is used, just a few megabytes of memory is used on each one of these hosts, which enables you to deploy this in a hyper-converged manner if you want to, or you can do two-layer, keeping your application and your storage separate. So again, aggregates all those and scales linearly. So we can go from three hosts all the way up to 1,024 hosts, and you're getting scaling of I.O. and um, not only the performance, but the capacity as you grow it. And we can add this on the fly. So we can actually add hosts on the fly. We can remove hosts. You can actually use this as a migration tool. If some new great storage technology comes out, you can buy some new servers with those, add those to the cluster, remove the old ones, the data will migrate automatically. Or I can say, I just need more compute. I can purely buy nodes with no disks and add them to the cluster and have them just consume the storage that's being provided if I've already got enough performance or capacity from what I've built. Or I can buy pure storage nodes with very small CPUs, very little memory, and just similar disk configurations and add those to the cluster. Or I can buy systems that do both, and I can scale both my storage performance capacity as well as the applications that I can run. So it's extremely flexible. I honestly don't know how you could make storage more flexible. We can run on anything between Windows and Ubuntu for an operating system. We support all the major hypervisors. Um, we support all the, the major cloud infrastructures, Docker, VMware, OpenStack. And we can work on any media, hard drive, SSD, NVMe, it doesn't matter. Whatever comes next, it'll work, because it's software that's abstracted from the hardware, but it's fully leveraging the hardware. We take full advantage of those RAID controllers you have in your boxes to optimize the performance to those devices. And what's really amazing is these can be all on the same cluster. I could have 100 servers with 10 Windows, 10 Linux, 10 Red Hat, whatever it is, and they can take their local disks, share them out, and then consume them back, but aggregate all of that performance and capacity without having to plan ahead of time uh, for different points where I'm going to have to go buy more storage, I can make that decision on the fly, and it doesn't even matter what OS I need to put on that box. That also means that you could run it for, you could have it attached to your legacy systems, which could consume it you know, for like VMware clusters and also OpenStack simultaneously. Absolutely. Even bare metal. So you've got a bare metal application that still needs block storage. You can just add a client to it, just like you would an HBA driver, but without the actual fiber channel card. So logically, we break, there's three major components to Scale.io. One of them is the client, which we refer to as the Scale.io data client, or the shorthand we use is SDC. Um, this is just a driver you load on any system that you want to provide storage to. The Scale.io data server, or SDS, is the component you load on any box that you want to take the local drives and share them with the pool. And then the metadata infrastructure is managed what we call MDMs, or metadata servers. And that's a cluster of three or five, depending on how much resiliency you want. Again, all of these have very low footprints. And so I can run all three of these on a single box and take very little resources on that box while I am doing that work. And the cool thing about this architecture is the metadata server is not in the path in any way, shape, or form. So when I'm reading and writing data, the client knows exactly which hosts have my blocks of storage that I need to go out to, and in a massively parallel way, go out to all those SDSs, grab and read and write that data, and the metadata server is not a bottleneck in that growth path. And so the only time the metadata server does any work is if there's a drive failure. There's a node failure. It takes action and communicates to the other components. Or I create a volume, and then I map it to a host. It's taking action. But other than that, it's not doing anything other than monitoring the system. So for integration, we've actually been integrated with scale OpenStack uh, since Havana, but we got upstreamed in the Liberty release. Um, and right now, we have beta plugins, which Randy's development team has been working with me on. Uh, from Rantus Fuel, Canonical. I've got links at the end. Please do download them and try them if you're using those distributions. If you're using other distributions, we have Ansible and Puppet scripts out there to try. But if you do a manual load of this, you'll see it's actually very simple. You could take any automation framework and automate this deployment process yourself. So the integration with OpenStack is really just the sender driver calling our API, right? We've got a, a gateway service that we run. It's using a REST API. That talks to the MDM to say create a volume, delete a volume, grow a volume, and then the Nova compute component that attaches that volume once it's been provisioned. And just a couple announcements of what we did in Mataka that just came out. We added full QoS support. So we've actually had QoS support before, and uh, I think Scaleo has a pretty cool QoS. You actually can take a volume and say this volume gets this much I.O. to this client, 
Or you can say this volume gets this much bandwidth to this client. Or I can even do both. I can use both metrics to, to limit how much that, that client is going to consume. And so we, prior to Metaka, we could do this, but you had to create a volume definition and you had to use extra spec definitions, which totally works, except that it was very specific to scale I.O. And that's not the OpenStack way. The OpenStack way is to make it generic so that if I ever change storage vendors, I don't have to go do that again, right? So now we've got full support for QoS and OpenStack. We also added support for consistency groups, which is really useful when you're running like an Oracle database like we're gonna show here, where you've got several volumes that when you need to take a snapshot, you need to capture all of those simultaneously. And then finally, we added the ability to bring volumes under management or take them out of management, so to make OpenStack aware of existing volumes or not. So in the lab, what we've got is we've got an Oracle VM that's got 64 gigs of RAM, 16 virtual CPUs. We're gonna use the Swingbench tool as the client to generate load. It's a free tool you can download. And the demo flow, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna show you a really heavy I.O. load. So I'm gonna do an FIO job just to create some massive load and show you a migration in that process just to show how that works. And then we'll do a 20 database user load and then a 200 database load, user load and we'll do migrations for each of those. And so we'll have some time as that's kicking off to, to take some questions. So what hardware we're we using? So I'm gonna connect remotely to Gear in Massachusetts. We've got actually eight servers. Seven of them are going to take their local capacity and share them out. Um, they're using three SSDs each. So we've got 21 SSDs that is going to be doing all the work in this demo. Now, we actually have hard drives in these boxes too. Some of them have six, some of them have 10. We've added them and they are a separate pool. I could put volumes on them as well. And again, just showing the flexibility of the system, it doesn't matter. I can have a mix of nodes with different numbers of drives and I can still use those and I can still allocate storage to those and still make, take full advantage of those. Um, on the compute side, I'm gonna take those same seven nodes and I'm gonna run, that's where their applications will run. And then I've got one other client there that's just, just purely a client attached to the storage, but not sharing any storage. So as you can see, we're doing hyperconverged, two layer, all on the same system. Two layer meaning that the storage is on dedicated separate storage nodes and or separate from the compute. Right, yeah, the compute's separate. So there's some applications, and actually Oracle tends to be a prime example for customers where they want to truly isolate them because the license cost of Oracles can be so high <laughs> that they want to separate that and get every bit of CPU they can out of those boxes that they paid Oracle a lot of money for uh, to run. <laughs> Uh, so the software we're using is Oracle 12, um, OpenStack Liberty, CentOS 7.2, and uh, ScaleIO 2.0. So just a little map of how we've wired everything up. So here's our eight nodes. The first one is gonna be running our OpenStack controller, and that's what I'm gonna be SSH to for most of my, uh, most of my tasks. Um, that box is running the client and the server, so it's sharing storage, consuming it. The next three boxes are sharing storage and consuming it, as well as running the metadata infrastructure. Uh, the next three boxes are sharing storage and consuming it, and the last box is purely consuming it. And each one of these hosts has two 10 gig connections for all that it's doing. So all data, whether it's storage and application traffic, are running over these two 10 gig interfaces. And so as we're doing a lab migration, I'm pushing 64 gigs of memory across the wire. We'll see a little bit of impact to scale I.O., but um, it should hold up like a champ. It better. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can see my three instances here. Uh, prod DB1 is the instance where I've got Oracle. Uh, it's installed, it's not running right now. I don't wanna have it running at the, at the moment. We'll, we'll, at, we'll do that after we do the FIO load. You'll see a few volumes here attached, the database, the application. We also have one called Big IOPS. That is a volume we've uh, allocated just to, for doing FIO raw to the device so we can generate some load. On the scale IO side, we have, this is our user interface. You've got the raw capacity, so the capacity is licensed, by the way, with ScaleIO by how much you allocate, how, many, how, many, how much capacity you give to the SDSs, that's how the licensing works. So it's very easy to predict as you go forward and to license more if you wanna purchase more. I've got my IO. You can see I've got eight SDCs, I've got eight clients attached. I've got seven volumes mapped. So that means I've got seven volumes created and they are mapped and attached to hosts right now, but I've actually got 19 volumes defined. <coughs> I'm only actively using 17. I've got seven SDSs, and among those, I've got actually 79 devices that are being used. That's a physical disk drive. Yep. And then on the management side, we have three MDMs, and we have two replicas and, two, and one tiebreaker in that architecture. 
And the warning is purely the I'm using the free version warning. And the last one here is protection domain. So uh, Scale.io has a concept of protection domains for isolation. So once you grow to, to say, a 1,000 nodes in a cluster, you want to isolate where your data is being written. And so you can take 100 nodes and create a protection domain of those and 100 nodes. And within that protection domain, we have two storage pools, a hard drive and an SSD pool. So the protection domain, that's largely because if you start to have bad behavior or problems within one area, you don't want it to spill over. Like suddenly you've got a problem crossing your entire 1,000 node cluster. Yeah, it's all about uh, isolation. So if we look at the front end, so we have this concept of a front end. You've got volumes, you've got clients, you've got snapshots. If we look at the clients, we can see here C6 it has six volumes that are mapped to it. So that's obviously the node that is currently running my database instance. If I look at the back end, we have a protection domain that we've named OpenStack. And there's two pools here, one that's SSD and one that's hard drive. There's really nothing going on here, but we can see that we have three devices for each one of these. And if I quickly look at the hard drive one, we'll see this one has 10 hard drives. And if I scroll way down here, we'll see some nodes actually only have a remote desktop. Uh, six hard drives. So, but those are all still one pool, and I could read and write and create volumes to those right now. So you don't have to have a homogenous system. You can exactly. Have a so let's go ahead and fire up FIO. There we go. So I'm SSH's root into the system that is running that instance. And we'll see the IOPS grow here. How big are these blocks? Uh, that's a good question. I think they're 8K. So we're getting about 150,000 IOPS off of the, the uh, seven nodes with three SSDs each. So while that's running, I'm going to go ahead and create some logs here, or I'm going I'm to loop some logs so you can see what's going on as we do this migration. So right now, we can see that we're on C6. We're active. The instance is active there. I'm going to go ahead and SSH to C6. And I'm going to tail the Nova compute log which is actually not all that exciting, but they're all geeks. They can handle it. Um, and then I'm going to run a loop with VRSH to look at just the memory. So that what you'll see here, once I start a migration, is you'll see it'll start counting down the memory. So it's trying to move the memory from one host to another, and it'll count down its memory that it's migrated. And it's constantly doing a calculation of, can I get this moved over in the default threshold, which I believe seems to be about a second. I haven't got any confirmation on that from anyone. But uh, it seems to be about a second as the tolerance for a quote unquote downtime for a migration. So it's calculating constantly as it's moving this memory over the wire. Can I get it over in a second? Can I get it over in a second. And it, once it can, it then does the flip. So let me do a live migrate. So I'm just doing Nova live dash migration and the name of the instance. This is all the built in OpenStack live migration support. Yep. Yeah, nothing special here. So we now see the status is migrating. Let me, uh, and the Nova compute logs up top should start to refresh. And on the right here, we should start to see a memory countdown. Did you pray to the demo gods in advance? I did. I even sacrificed a chicken at lunch. Um, it was delicious barbecue. <laughs> so you can see the memory's counting down. And what, you'll, what we'll find here is that with FIO, there's almost nothing really active in memory. So this will actually flip over pretty quick. As we start to do database loads, where there's lots of things going on in memory, this will take longer. Um, as it's trying to get memory, but stuff is still happening in memory, so it has to keep trying to move new writes in and out. In VMware world, do, you, do they still like recommend that you have like, you know, a billion network interfaces so that you can have them dedicated to vMotion and all that stuff? Do they still do that? Honestly, I don't know. It's Does been a while since I took my VMware training. They do. Yeah. So uh, this is a little bit gee whiz then, because we're running the transfer over the same network as the, yeah. as the storage. Yeah, we're doing this all with two 10 gig NICs for everything. So we're, we're basically migrating a pet. Yep. Yeah. And we wanted to show you Oracle Rack today, but you know, it's, 
a little That's complicated. So oh yeah, we're Oracle gonna, Rack. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we need a little more time in the lab to get that figure that. out Oracle. Yeah, <laughs> that'll be good. That's a cadre of pets. <laughs> And there it's flipped over. So now on the left here, it should switch from migrating to active. It should tell me which host it's moved to. So it's now active on C5. So I've done the migration and still was able to get all the, those. So we went down from about 150,000 IOPS to 117 at the very, very end there. And now it's bouncing back. So that's pretty good. So I'm going to go ahead and start up Oracle Database because it takes a minute. And that number, the number under the IOPS where it says 1.1 gigabytes a second, that's the that's the, the throughput? Yep. Okay. Oh, yeah. Let me go kill the uh, FIO that's still running. And those network interfaces are bonded? No. no. They're just two separate networks. Okay. Two VLANs. So the database is up. And let me go ahead and start the listener service. And now that that's up, let me go to our web interface, if I can find my mouse, and start Swingbench. So I've got a, a, a console here on the other instance that I'm using for load generation. And this is a little bit of a finicky tool, uh, finicky tool so I may have to stop and start it a couple times to get it to go, just a heads up. It's not, it's not us. Is this an official Oracle load tool? I do not believe so. I think someone at Oracle wrote it on the side. OK. It's not clear to me if it's Swingbench or if I'm still waiting for the database to get ready to do stuff. So, so uh, when I was first automating Oracle databases with Puppet in like 2006, I found out that when you make an empty Oracle database, it takes 30 minutes to complete. <laughs> I don't know what it's doing. Like you say, MySQL, you know, create create database and it's done in like a split second with Oracle it takes 30 minutes just empty database just one nice command. all right so that works so I, right here this is literally out of the box swing bench settings all I did is change the users to 20 and I got 20 active users and what you'll see here uh, in the right is that it says 20 of 20 so if any any lo user loses its session that number will go down so in our migration if something got really horrible that number would go down and here I can see my transactions per second is averaging about 200 transactions per second. You can see my IL load is actually not that high. I've only got about 4,000 IOPS for 20 users to do this workload. Now, while that's running, I'm going to go SSH to C5 to run those logs again. Start the memory loop. OK. So let's see, our load gen is ramped up. Yep, a little over 200 transactions per second still, so we're stabilized. These are just default settings. That's why it's 200 TPS. So I'm going to run the live migration again. Let me get all my windows so you can see them well. I mean, I think you'll be able to guess what happens, right? It moves. Shouldn't be any problems. <laughs> the important thing is that uh, you know you shouldn't see any significant dips in the transactions um, here, and I don't expect to at 5,000 IOPS. But you know I, I think it's interesting because you know one of the main problems I've seen people have is trying to put pets on cattle clouds and cattle on pet clouds, and and I do think that there's a way forward where we could where we can start to do some of that. I think there are limits on how many on what kind of pets you can put on a cattle cloud. Um, and there's a lot of gaps, right? We don't have like DRS, VMware DRS, and HA type capabilities in OpenStack really yet. We have some HA type stuff. We've got live migration tools. There was a big dip, um, but um, we don't, um, you know, we don't have quite all the pieces that are needed for people to put like SAP deployments or ERP systems or some of the really classic kind of you know uh, workloads that can't manage themselves. Um, so this isn't the only tool that's required, but you know we thought it'd be really interesting to kind of showcase it and show um, how it works. 
Um, we did performance in Tokyo. We sort of talked about performance at scale IO, but you know you can get performance out of any kind of system. I think at this point, but supporting things like uh, live migration of heavy workloads, transactional workloads, uh, supporting live migrations of things like the the multi master write disk for Oracle Rack, um, you know that kind of thing is um, is actually pretty tricky. Um, so. I don't know. I mean, does anybody have any questions or thoughts or feedback? Can you go to the mic if you have questions? Pretty please. So that, that dip is actually expected. It's just when it first starts, because basically it was queuing the migration, but it actually, once it starts, you get this little brief dip, and then it comes right back up. Name and company, and then question. Good question. So on the back end here, we can see um, at the pool level, we can see the, the IOPS and what each device is doing. And there's a whole bunch of advanced views in here. Um, we can actually see device latencies as well. Oh, we can, we can put the FIO back up. FIO is not running. Right, we could put it. Oh, back. yeah, yeah, afterwards we can run it again. Honestly, not sure the best way to get latency. I think they want to know under pressure, like if you get the right behavior of uh, so the disk subsystem. You can see the response time at the application level here too. Um, and it, when it was doing that uh, first one, it went up. But other than that, we're averaging uh, 34 milliseconds but from that's the a, application. That's a light. That's a pretty light. 200 TPS. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Well, we'll up it. We'll up it to 200 here in a minute. So you'll see it's kind of fighting. There's more memory work going on here. So it's kind of fighting. It'll go up and down and up and down. And it should finish without help. Now, once I get to 200, it's not going to finish without help. The default one second is not going to be enough time. I find that it's about one and a half seconds that it needs. This is the delta of new in-memory changes yeah. versus the time it takes it to, to copy it over the wire the to, yeah. to get it to the other host. So it's, it finished flipping over there. And we saw, again, just a brief blip there. Sessions never dropped, and the application kept running. Oh, jeez. I know you. <laughs> Identify yourself regardless. Um, Mark Heckman, Ubisoft. Um, this is a boot from volume VM? Yes. OK. And so will this work with Metaka? Because I believe the support has sure. been in Metaka as a standard Cinder volume. With so live block migrate. Are you talking ephemeral or are you talking uh, persistent? Uh, I don't know what you mean. I mean, the instance itself, the root right, of the instance would mm -hmm. be on local instance storage, so ephemeral, right? So you do a live block migrate. Not, not a standard live migration, but a block migration. And so then Cinder would be, your, your scale IO would be just a regular Cinder volume. Right. So. So two things. Um, one is you can't mix your your local if you're doing ephemeral locally with a persistent volume on Cinder, and do a migration with it. Sure, you today. can. You can today. No, you cannot. No. Why not? We do it. So you can do boot from you're volume, which is what this is doing. Huh? So the vol the the root volume is on scale I/O. We created as a persistent volume and told it to boot from it. We uh, we are contributing code to Newton to add support to do ephemeral on scale I.O. so that you, when you provision ephemeral, you can say, I would prefer that to be not local, but on scale I.O. We actually have the code today, and it works with the plugins. The plugins automatically apply that patch, um, but uh, it's not built into OpenStack yet. Because migrating Cinder volumes, doing live migration of attached Cinder volumes, uh, is, as far as I know, is a freshly supported in Metaka. Yeah, that was. That was multiple volumes attached to the Oracle database via Cinder that were live migrated. Yeah, we're doing that right now with Liberty. Okay. These are all attached to Cinder with Liberty. Yeah, but except that, except that your 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 actual OS is on is on is, is a boot the from boot volume disk OS. is a boot from volume right. via Cinder. Right. That's the difference. So it's not Nova ephemeral. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Right. But, but we'll no take this up. We'll take this up later. Yeah, we can chat later. <laughs> the, yeah. the, the, there are, the, we have Nova ephemeral drivers working, and my team is working on upstreaming them now oh in Newton. Mm -hmm. And so there will be support for scale IO, both for Nova ephemeral and Cinder volumes. Mm -hmm. Now, I actually don't know, know what happens if you 
Do you know what happens if you have it, it both works. of those and you I mean, might migrate? It's supposed to work as of Metaka, even on Ice House with some special Red Hat OpenStack. Higgery stack. jiggery poking. <laughs> but Red Hat OpenStack patches on Ice House make it work as well. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Mark. What's the next demo? Uh, so now we've got 200 users. Um, we're doing about 1,900 transactions per second. And we're on C6, so let me start logs on. You said this doesn't work, or you just said the live migrate never finishes. No, 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 that's with 200. So on this one, we're going to have to help it along. I'll show you what I mean in a minute here. Let me switch over to C6. Run the memory loop. And start the live migration. So we're doing about 1,900 transactions per second. And what we'll see again is as soon as it starts the process, we'll see a little bit of a dip. And then it'll come back up. And then it'll start to try. And what you'll see is if we don't help it along, it'll keep going up and down. And that will have some impact on performance. Again, it doesn't stop the user from doing its work, but the transactions per second kind of wobble as it's trying to flip over and keeps fighting the memory to get it over the network to the other host as it's working. So we should do that, and then you should flip over to the FIO again yeah. so we could answer the gentleman's question about latency, because I, sure. I think that's a really interesting question, because uh, a lot of the pet workloads make assumptions about the latency of disks because there seem to be, you know, essentially local. Yeah. local. <laughs> um, and so when they behave really badly, like I've had problems with, um, with uh, VMware systems running on top of like ZFS a long time ago. And uh, where the system would become unresponsive and then Linux would make the file system read only because it's like the disk is bad. It doesn't know that like you're going over the network. Right. So it just thinks the latency is related to the disk. It's like, oh, high latency disk. It must be a bad disk. Read only file system so we don't destroy things. Right? Yeah, kill it. Yeah. Uh, you have a question? Yes. Uh, name and company? Uh, Ketan Nilangekar from Veritas. Uh, so on the on the target here, the target node that you're migrating to, is there a copy of the data already available, or uh, is that being block migrated as you? As no, it doesn't need to be because because it's a distributed block storage system, so the data is everywhere. So it's just accessing it over the network from from the source. Correct. Yeah. It's Everything. really just doing a mapping change and say, okay, this volume is now available to this host, and just doing that flip. So that API call is immediately saying, okay, change the mapping from host five to host six. So once the live migration is done, is there an attempt made to get the data over? Or does it always stay? It's already distributed across all of the disks within the pool. So all seven nodes are ho holding pieces of that volume. All the clients can see all of the disks potentially. They just have to have the appropriate permissions and mapping. All right. the data is shared. Got it. And one more question on the QoS. Uh, when you said you have a, at what level do you maintain the QoS, uh, meaning as the data is coming out of the VM, it travels through your uh, what your scale IO client. Uh, it, where 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 all do you enforce the QoS? It's at the client level. So the client side driver basically says you you're only allowed to have this much IOPS or this much bandwidth. I see. Okay. Thanks for this volume. So that's specific to the volume. All right. So we can see it's kind of struggling. It's fighting. Uh, going up and down. So let me let me change the threshold. So the command is uh, virsh migrate dash set downtime instance name and then the millisecond. So I'm going to give this a little help and set it to allow it to go up to five seconds for a downtime. It really only needs about one and a half, two seconds to do this flip over. And again, it's spiking, but the the sessions never never die. Um, so they're just not getting as responsive. Of, of a, they're not getting as fast as a database response out of the database system. So you should you should set, set a file so we can answer okay. into that just gentleman's question. But I, I remember I was talking to SAP recently. I don't know mm -hmm. if they're in here, but they have a they have a special boxes for SAP HANA, the in memory database. They're like yes. one terabyte <laughs> of RAM. <laughs> don't do this with that. Don't let it migrate one terabyte of RAM. Um, oh, more questions. Yes, sir. Would you mind going to a mic or taking this mic from me? And I'm no FIO expert, so can you tell me how to get the latency data? 
Uh, just look at the disks, I think, might be a good start. Yeah, so uh, Richard Cowell, GDT. Um, do you support any type of like data locality or anything like that with, with scale IO? So we have a concept of fault sets. So if you're concerned that, say, multiple nodes inside of a single chassis, like a 2U 4N chassis, or you're concerned about rack availability, you can set a fault set to say, this node is one, this rack is one fault set. And what that tells Scale.io is that to create its mirrors outside of that rack. So that entire thing can go down and your, your system's available. You can also use that for maintenances, too. If I'm going to do reboots on all the hosts inside a rack, I can, I can tell the system I'm going to go into maintenance for this fault set. By default, if you don't define a fault set, it's every node is a fault set. So it's basically telling the system, mirror my data outside of this node is the default behavior. But you can make it whatever logical concept you want. Let me answer that just slightly differently. Sure. Um, so the part of the reason for the production domains is not only to have sort of bounding of faults, but also bounding of performance because you don't want you know noisy neighbors or whatever to, to serve somebody next door. But the the production domains are arbitrary. They're however you want to do it. So one way you might want to do it is you might want to have a production domain per rack. And what you're essentially making sure is that like all of the data is basically across all the disk and you're on a single switch or a couple of switches. And at that point, whether you're talking to a local disk or talking to another disk in the rack, I mean, there's no, there's literally zero overhead from the network. So you have locality in that from a performance perspective, you're not adding additional latency with mm -hmm. east-west traffic across racks. So you could do that if that workload for, and you can do that on a per pool basis, I believe, right? So you could set up a pool that's like per rack and then have another one that goes across racks depending on what you're trying to accomplish. So you can, you can get that effect that you want, but there isn't the concept of sort of make sure that like all the data this database is writing is on these set of disks and also copied somewhere else. That makes sense. All right, so I got the FIO job running. You got the FIO job running. So we'll, we'll see if we can figure out how to get the latency. We'll at least look at the latency on the disks um, if you want to go into the back end there. And this gentleman can go ahead and identify himself and ask a question real quick. Yeah, Ryan Nicometto, Concurrent. So you talked a little bit about protection groups. Just could you talk a little bit about protection data? Protection domains? Yeah, protection domains, yeah. yeah. Could you talk about data protection in general and how you handle that? Do you have a erasure coding kind of equivalent or do you rely on individual nodes for that? I'm going to let the experts answer this. I think I know the answer, but. <laughs> so we basically do a mesh mirroring algorithm. Um, so it, it mirrors across all the, all the SDSs within that storage pool or within that protection domain. Um, so it's, it's mirroring outside, and that's what makes it very fast and allows us to have a very small footprint and allows you to run hyperconverge, run these applications on the same systems because we're not, we're not doing all the extra load. We're just simply taking the pure performance of that disk with very little overhead and giving you full access to it and doing mesh mirroring. It's, it's two it. replicas, though, inside of a protection domain, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, it's It's only two replicas, and that's to optimize rebuild speed, right? Yep. And so if we lose a disk, well, how, how long does it take us typically to rebuild onto it? It's a matter of minutes. It really is fast. So answer your question. And the rebuilds are massively parallel. So you have seven nodes. When a drive fails, all seven nodes are involved in rebuilding that data in a very efficient way. So the the time is actually for an SSD is a matter of seconds, really. So it's been optimized for tier one performance and throughput, not necessarily for extreme data protection. You should still use backups and all that good stuff. Is Vincent Sixwin? When you're on FIO, your IO def is 128, which I think is quite unrealistic. What is the performance when the IO def is 1 or 2 instead of 128? So if you, you, you're, if you have a problem with this running 128 for IO def? Yes, for me, uh, it's quite unusual. I mean, usually I mean you should be able to get 32 to each disk, right? Yeah, At least I, 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 I agree, disk. Why would you only run with 1 or 2 IO def? That's just to, to better understand the latency in that case. Huh? To better understand the latency. Oh, to better understand the latency? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, you want to run that IO depth at one or two? You, you want me to run? One or two? Two. <laughs> two it is. Two. Okay, and then I don't know if there's a great way to see the latency like this on the, um, on the disks. Yeah. And somebody got a VM stat or a SAR or something. IO stat on their back back pocket. <laughs> That's who I should have asked. <laughs> Thank you. And what number am I looking at? <laughs> I think it's the one of the weights. Yeah. 
So there you go. We're at, was that microseconds? Milliseconds? So we're half a millisecond, so. Yeah, between a millisecond or less. 500 microseconds, right? So that's pretty good. I mean, in our tests, we're basically, you know, we're a very thin layer on top of SSDs. Like, if you run ScaleAO across a whole bunch of scale-out SSDs, you basically get near, near linear performance increase across the entire cluster, up to 100 plus nodes. I think we've tested far above that. So uh, it's pretty impressive because a lot of times you would go to, you know, classic SAN, like Extreme IO or another all flash array. I'll even mention my competitor, Solid Fire, Pure, whatever. And, you know, you've got two boxes and you're getting a lot of throughput, you know, basically as much as, as you've got SSDs in there. And, but we can get that same speed out of, you know, just regular commodity SSDs and commodity hardware, but like scaled out in ways. So any, any final yep. questions there? I think we're at our time. Yeah, we're at our time. So. Um, in summary, I like to say, uh, don't wait. <laughs> if you're going to be looking at OpenStack, those deployments take time. But either way, you need to find a storage technology you're comfortable with that scales out. You don't want storage to be your bottleneck when you're providing cloud services. You don't want to tell your customer, I'm sorry, you got to wait till I get another rack of X in to provide some more compute for you. So I think it's important to think about what your storage plan is and get comfortable with that technology. Scale IO is useful for building any cloud. You saw the technologies we support. Um, you can download it for free, give us feedback. Uh, we've got beta versions of the plugin. You'll have access to these decks later. Chad blog has a posting on it. There's some recent reviews from Storage Review on our technology where they hammer it. Um, and there's a session shortly after this by Swisscom. Swisscom built their cloud on scale IO with OpenStack, with Docker, Didn't and they start with Ceph? Foundry. What was that? Didn't Swisscom start with Ceph? I think so. Yeah, I heard that too. Um, and there's, there's a session on Thursday. And if you want the Ceph versus Scale.io debate, you can watch our session from the Tokyo Summit that's online as well. Our, our best customer is an ex-Ceph customer. So if you're using Ceph today, that's fantastic. Please let me know when you have problems with it, <laughs> and we'll be happy to help you out. Thank you for coming. And oh, yep. Sorry, stand by. We're giving away free goods. Free goods, free goods. That's why we kept you all here. I was wondering why you didn't just escape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. The number is uh, 305310. 310. Bueller? You have to be here. Bueller? Okay. Oh, we got one. Woo! Come on down. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Let me verify. Trust but verify. That's it. Okay, wait. I got to take oh. a picture. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>